There are few things in the setting of Battletech that invoke such excitement or feelings as mercenary forces from the broad Battletech fanbase. While clans and houses are huge, overwhelming, and often uncaring entities that more often than not are governed by brutal internal politics and an insatiable lust for power, regardless of if it's the Capellan Confederation, Clan Jade Falcon, the Hell's Horses, or the Federated Sons, there is a smaller, more human element to the setting. No, I'm not talking about the Blessed Order and the Word of Blake either, in their journey towards enlightenment, who may just be helping you on your way to some form of enlightenment using nuclear physics. In this particular piece, we're going to be talking with the real last puzzle piece, to the Battletech Jigsaw puzzle. That is, of course, the Humble Mercenary. Does your house or clan not appreciate you? Did you want to make some real money without taking orders from a bunch of fools who you know better than? Well, being a mercenary can really open up a world of opportunities for you, and in a wide number of ways. While the houses and clans are more often than not locked into their lanes due to a number of necessities, mercenaries just aren't. Some will have a heart of gold and some will be the absolute scum of the inner sphere. Many others will be anything in between. Some were formed from tragedy and misunderstanding, or a personal vendetta, or just the desire for cold hard cash. It doesn't really matter, because the mercenary is all of these things, and more. As some of you will know, I've done two prior ranking videos regarding factions. One of which I went over the clans, and the other I went over factions in general. In the latter's case, people wondered why I didn't have any mercenaries on the list. I love mercenaries, but they aren't at the center of the setting for me, even if they are an invaluable part of it. So in this video, I'm going to talk about my favorite mercenary units. Some of them it's because of the source books. Some of them it's because of their novels. Some of them it's because I like the swagger of their steps. There are literally too many mercenaries in Battletech for me to count. So I'm just going to be covering the top ones I like. I don't think there are any mercenaries I dislike even, so this is just going to be good times for everyone. So where shall we begin? Let's start at the back end of this lineup and work our way towards my favorite. While some might think the Marauder is a bit overrated in the Succession Wars, I still love it. Who doesn't love the Marauder, really? Can you say you have a heart unless you love this... weird, evil lobster-looking machine? Well, I love the Marauder, for all of its faults, and it only gets better with time. I wish I could say the same for the unit that most famously uses it. Miller's Marauders, which later became Barber's Marauders, fits in the first spot here for little other reason than the fact that I personally love the Marauder Battle Mech, and think it's absolutely spectacular that there was a big unit that is almost entirely made up of Marauders. And Marauder 2s, to be clear. All they did was go around the Inner Sphere kicking ass in these machines. The reason I use the past tense though, unfortunately, is that this lovable band of mercenaries, with their vast armada of Marauders, were sadly defeated and destroyed by Clan Jade Falcon after a raid went wrong in the Federated Commonwealth Civil War. It was, sadly, one of the many units that were destroyed during the Great Purge from the Fedcom Civil War through to the Blakest Era regarding mercenary commands. Still, if you want a blast from the past, try out the Marauders. One day, we can hope that they return in some form, headed by a great and glorious black-clad Marauder, which shows everyone the colors. There are a number of regiments of mercenaries that have the look, name, and feel of machines that might as well have been dropped out of a Wild West movie and fit absolutely in line with Battletech's gunslinger-styled lore. In this instance, I'm not referring to the SLDF's gunslingers, but just the general gait and style that the setting, especially early on, carried for itself. And I'm a sucker for it a little bit. The Lone Star Regiment, however, takes this feel and atmosphere 
and then links it up almost with the Gunslinger concept from the SLDF. A lot of the most famous mercenary commands in Battletech have their origins in the collapse of the Star League, or from the time shortly after it, and in the cases of the LSR, they were a cool, hard-hitting unit that first appeared in 2825. Originating from Somerset, just like the memes from the cartoon, the Lone Stars fought for the DCMS for centuries before the Combine had a meltdown and declared that all mercenaries had to die. A top-tier decision by Kurita Takashi, there is no doubt. Who am I to judge the coordinator, after all? Anyway, they took on a contract from the Fed Sons after this, before jumping ship in 3050 and taking up a contract with the Torian Concordat, which honestly is really fitting, given the name, style, color scheme, and of course the memes of what the Torian Concordat is, according to sways of the community. Unfortunately, much like the meme of the Torian Concordat as Space Texas, this arrangement and the Lone Star Regiment didn't last forever. They got annihilated during the Blakest Era, another one of the many commands to have had this fate, when they were crushed in this case by Hansen's Rough Riders. Inevitably, why do I like the Lone Star Regiment? They looked cool, they had a cool name, they were a solid DCMS contracted mercenary unit for a long time, and they had a cool origin. Overall, I thought they were just really awesome, basically. Repping the Cameron Star too, as if they were remembering happier days. Well, much like the League, they're a thing of the past. Some commands were destroyed early on in the setting's history. They were like names on a list that Fassa was checking off to give rep to the clans during the invasion, and their lore beforehand either wasn't considered or wholly wasn't fleshed out. There are two units on this list that end up like this, and one of them is right here, with the oldest known mercenary command as of the date of their formation, the Gravewalkers. I think they're neat, to be frank just an old bones unit, older than any others. The tragedy, of course, is that the 31st century was just a tragedy for them. I love the Third Succession War and imagine that these guys were just running around the Inner Sphere, and they even had fun during the Fourth Succession War too. But then things hit the clan invasion, and that's where it all goes downhill. Two regiments were functionally destroyed, the unit was even officially listed as annihilated during the invasion in the original TRO 3050. It turns out a single battalion survived, and then, only a decade later, their remnants were mauled again. From here, it was only a matter of time. Brought down to only a handful of mechs, they died with a whisper, being absorbed into the Galhounds before the end of the century, becoming their second battalion, no less. Its last major action was on Tharkad, where they acquitted themselves well. You know what would be cool though? With the Kelhounds fracturing during the Dark Age into their own units, I'd love to see these guys come back in their own colors once more. Would it count as the Gravewalkers? Maybe, maybe not. But they were a cool command, as I mentioned earlier, and it would be cool to see someone repping that signature once again. But why do I like them? Easy. An ancient mercenary unit that was as tough as nails. It's quite a claim to fame to be older than the Aridani Light Horses. The downfall angle always gets me too. Ah, more misery heaped upon misery. What if there was another unit like the Aerodani Light Horses? But it died horrifically during the clan invasion. The unit was big by the clan invasion. Very big. Like, four regiments big. While I don't have as much to say about the history of the 12th Star Guards, it's still an incredibly awesome unit, and its death once more at the hands of Clan Jade Falcon was sad. In TRO 3050, it is one of the named Merc Commands that got got by the clans. It is definitely one of the units that was created to not be alive. They were a veteran and elite formation. They got screwed by the Combine, as is tradition in Battletech, and they fought across the Inner Sphere for centuries. In the background that's been fleshed out for them since their destruction, it just feels like the unit was as glorious as their initial blurbs indicated. While not as old as the Gravewalkers, and not as fleshed out as the Aerodani Light Horses, this unit was born of two Star League regiments that didn't drink Alexander Kerensky's Kool-Aid, and they were just a superb unit. I put them at my number 7, 
If you like mercenary commands, your opinions of the word of Blake and Jade Falcons are likely to be impacted at some point when we start digging through this list, as you can probably tell. RIP the 12 Star Guards. Hashtag rest in power. Not every Blakist was happy in the word of Blake. This is something that I think gets lost during the Blakist era itself. And it's Jumanji. For the purposes of YouTube, I don't actually say the name of the era on this platform. But let's get back to business. The acts of the word of Blake became so intensely bad during this era that not everyone who bought into Blake's bullshit, I mean, followed the guiding path set out before them by the teachings of Jerome Blake, even within the word of Blake, was willing to go along for the ride. Thus, the heart of Blake was born. They are also known as Hunter's Hearts, depending on who their employers were supposed to be. Even in battle, these guys attempted to turn their enemies, should they be Blakists, from the path that they were on to a more reasonable one, revealing their true name and former allegiance. They were absolutely loathed by the word, especially given they revealed Blakist intelligence they'd gathered or gained from defections to their employers. Sadly, they would be annihilated all the same by the Regulan Fifes, in the same era that they were functionally born into. They were destroyed because House Cameron couldn't determine if they were who they said they were, or just more Blakists. A sad end to a cool concept, and just another sign that you can't have nice things if you enjoy Comstar. So, why do I like these guys? You basically already know. Love me Comstar. Love me Blessed Order. Love me Word of Blake. Simple as. It's also an interesting concept that they appeared and died within one era. I'd have loved to see these guys carry on, but that's just not in the cards. A lot of the time, the Blakest era is hard to love not just because of the things it took away, but because it removed many of the cool things about itself that it spawned. To be honest with you, this next entry almost lost out to the heart of Blake. In fact, I almost didn't put them on this list because for a very long time, they'd been a dedicated Capellan unit, rather than mercenaries that worked for the Confederation. This is true for more than a handful of other Liao mercenaries too, where they just got folded into the CCAF over time. Still, McCarran's Armored Cavalry is one of the deeper units in the lore of Battletech. When Big Mac shows up, you know a big fight's on. The first time I remember reading about them was the big blow-up with them and the Wolf's Dragoons, which I saw in the old Dragoon sourcebook when I was a kid. Bouncing around for a few years in the 30th century, eventually these guys become the Capellan go-to and get things done mercenary unit. Whether it be fighting the Goons, or fighting the Federated Sons, or even the Free Worlds League, or really anyone else the Cappies needed them to. There is a little too much for me to go over here, but I will say that in the Fedcom Civil War, with them becoming functionally a unit in the CCAF, was a bit of a downer for me. Still, there are some good snippets in the Ill Clan era that brings these guys back for me. While there are good and bad things about every era as a whole, Big Mac going back to being professionals for hire is definitely one of the cooler elements of things that have happened, even if it isn't world shifting. So what do I like about Big Mac? They're a storied, brutal unit that fought for the Capellan Confederation. That's why, to be frank. The Capellan Confederation sometimes feels like a faction that was small, got beat up, and wasn't really good at helping itself. But you know if Big Mac shows up, like I said at the beginning, there's gonna be a fight. I also really enjoyed that they were so spiteful and such jackasses that they went straight for the jugular against the Dragoons, too. Definitely worthy of being in my top five. I think this one will be a surprise for a lot of people, but I'm going to start this particular entry by pointing out that I am actually a fan of the new Grey Death Legion. It's been a long time since I read the original GDL series, but I'm generally not a huge fan of the GDL in its original form. It's a very popular unit and I respect that, but not everything works for everybody, and it's not like I dislike them, they just never clicked for me. 
It was one of the reasons why I was reluctant to first pick up The Price of Duty by Jason Schmetzer. I felt the unit was going to be too much of a homage to the original. And while there are elements of that, it's a fantastic novella and really propelled the new GDL for me. Mercenary's Honor, the follow-up, I enjoyed as well, but I think Price of Duty is a better book overall. Anyway, why am I bringing this up? Because these guys are my fourth favorite mercenary unit. I really enjoyed Ronan and to a lesser extent his sister Isabella's characters. I like how Frankenstein the unit is together and how they basically built it out of assets the Lyran Commonwealth misused and abused. I love the fact that they basically have taken the GDL name because it was lying around and they are fully just using it to get the most out of it that they can. I love all the potential this unit has and I think they're some of the best content to really come out at a smaller scale from the setting at the moment. It's not easy for me to like a new unit so quickly, but these guys are in my fourth place. You done killed my boy, you damn dirty goons. When I first started this channel a couple years ago, I almost paid zero attention to the rangers. They were an old, dead unit, and I didn't need to bother with them. Yeah, they had the comical beef with the Wolstergoons, but that was all that they had going for them. What kind of idiot puts their son in a wasp and sends them off to fight the Wolstergoon Zeta Battalion? How pathetic were these guys? This guy's son deserved it. But you know, I was guilty of not really paying much attention to it. I really do mean that. While I've always been a lore junkie, like anyone, I can ignore some of the better content in anything through disinterest or through a lack of attention. What's been nice about running the channel has been delving into the resources on every subject I cover, especially as the channel's grown in scope. The Waco's Rangers are my third favorite mercenary unit now. And it's because their story is so tragic, but also so well fleshed out, which you wouldn't expect. Again, another great story by Jason Spetzer, Making a Name, a short story, shows just what happened to John Waco, Wayne Waco's son. If you read his entry in the Old Mercenary Sourcebook, you realize that Wayne Waco had a series of calamities in his life before this too, despite being a capable military man. Waco suffered through the death of his wife, who he clearly loved very much after an incident with the Federated Sons. He never remarried or sought companionship in anything like the same way again. His son, who he was willing to debase himself for in order to try to save him, was killed, and the people who killed him did it in a terrible way. While it was sincerely an accident, the footage didn't really reveal that to him when he saw it. He was just a father watching his boy die in a tragedy beyond tragedy. From that moment forwards, his life is about revenge. The Waco's Rangers is about a man who wants revenge, not just on the Dragoons. That's just the focus of his anger and hatred. In many ways, it's about Wayne Waco wanting revenge almost on life. And he comes damn close to getting it. I'll not spoil too much. Right now, you're even seeing some incredible artwork from friend of the channel, Bruce Pinot, who is doing most of the artwork for the fully planned piece on the Rangers for this coming year. While the Rangers and Wayne Waco are bitter, angry people, their story, told through snippets, source books, and short stories, is one of the best complete narratives in the setting, if you can track them all down. Sometimes when you step on the little people, there are consequences. Shrapnel Issue 5, by the way, has an incredible story by Paul Schizarden. I probably said that name wrong, and I'm sorry, Paul. Named An Ice Cold Dish. I recommend you all check it out. Man, you would think that I hate these people after everything I just said, but no. I love the Wolstergoons. In fact, that's probably one reason why the Waco's Rangers managed to climb to the number three spot for me even. The Dragoons have some of the better, though still amusingly flawed at times, early lore in the franchise. 
The Wolstragoon Sourcebook is still one of the best that FASA pieced together in the 80s in my opinion, and its lore even has impact on relatively recent additions to the fiction today, such as Zalman's Stone Rhino being confirmed as being a part of the Dragoons, for instance. As everyone knows by now, the goons were clanners sent on a mission to infiltrate the Inner Sphere and recon the region to determine how they needed to proceed. It didn't, or did, go according to plan, and eventually the Dragoons bit the hand that fed them, and are now doing their own thing. They've been a part of some of the most storied campaigns in history, and have one of the best books from early Battletech, that being Wolves on the Border, written about their experiences on the planet of Misery. By the way, I have a script from Alex Knight that at some point soon I will convert into a video for everyone regarding Misery itself. I've just been caught up with other big projects, but it is still coming. Luthien wouldn't be Luthien without the Dragoons, not because the Goons were needed narratively for it, but because of the build-up of hatred between them and the Combine, being set aside for this grand battle to determine the fate of the Inner Sphere. Speaking of which, their involvement in the Fourth Succession War was legendary, and no matter how you cut things, the Dragoons have always had a big impact on the setting. Have they been suish at times before? Certainly. But it ebbs and flows. Some of the better content in the story has been anchored on them over the decades. Love them or hate them for it. I'd argue their backstory and character is far superior to the clan that was created narratively because of them, too. As yes, the Dragoons predate the concept of the clans themselves in real life. Just not in-universe, of course. Redemption Rights is also one of the better novels more recently to come out, and it's a goon's book. It's definitely something that made the Ill Clan era actually worth reading about, after the travesty of a novel that was Hour of the Wolf. So why do I love the Wolstergoons? Because of their history. Because I loved them as a kid. Because they're fun and their stories have often been engaging. Their characters are generally good too, even if there was a bit of a time where they were overexposed and just handled oddly. Like some parts with Jamie Wolfe being cloned or Natasha Kerensky's later career. But those are things that were not there for the entire time. There are parts I don't like, in other words. Sure, just as with anything. But the Dragoons actually do lose and they have lost before. And speaking of which, let's get to my number one pick. For those of you who follow my streams or any of my more opinion-oriented content, you'll know that this one was coming. My favorite faction of mercenaries in Battletech is of course the unstoppable, nation-destroying, dragoon-killing Hanson's Rough Riders, and there are a ton of reasons why, at least for me. I also want to give a shout out to Craig Reed before we get started for his great novella, Blood Rage, which is available digitally for people who backed the Kickstarter through Update 50 of the Mercenaries Kickstarter. It's a great read and shows the full fury of my boys, the Rough Riders. Anyway, let's delve into the history a bit before I give you all of the personal reasons I have for loving these absolute wreckers. They functionally start off as traitors to the Federated Suns, fleeing into Lyran space before becoming a line unit instead for the Free Worlds League, the 12th Atrian Dragoons. They would become disenchanted with this new realm as well, after being misused by the fractious Free Worlds League one time too often. After that, the Rough Riders were born when they became mercenaries wholesale and started to work for the Lyran Commonwealth. A combined arms formation with mechs and tanks, they became a renowned unit within the Commonwealth, where they were used to attack their former nation of origin, the Free Worlds League. But the thing that made them the stars that they are was their stunning victory over the Black Widow Company and the Wolstergoons in the 12th Battle of Hesphorus. This is what put the Rough Riders on the map, as this was the first true, conclusive, and staggering defeat that the Wolstergoons faced. And, had it not been for the Rough Riders, the Lyran defense would have imploded. After this, they continued their work for the Lyrans, through to their evolution to the Federated Commonwealth. They didn't get much action against the clans until Operation Bulldog, though, 
But the next real big narrative outing for the Rough Riders is their time in the Blakist era, where they ended up squaring off against the Torian Concordat. Some would look at this situation and go, a single mercenary unit? And one nowhere near as big as the Dragoons? Fighting an entire state? And its mercenary assets? And laugh at the idea of them being competitive. Well, as it turns out, the Torian Concordat did accidentally kill their families, which may have rubbed them the wrong way. And then they tried to cover up the fact that they did. As you can guess, this didn't really help with their Rough Riders situation. So the Rough Riders took that personally. And the Rough Riders absolutely mauled the Torian military and their mercenary assets in response. Only reassignment saved the Concordat from complete humiliation. Though one might argue that they got that anyway. It's a great story and I hope we get more of a novelization of it with time. The Dark Age was a bit of a weird time for the Rough Riders, and ends with them on Terra on the losing side against the Ill Clan. Now in the new era, they're working for Davian once more, coming full circle as it were. I'm hoping we get to see more from them soon. So why do I like them so much? I actually fell in love with the Rough Riders when I read through the Dragoon's sourcebook as a kid. They were tough enough to beat Natasha Kerensky, the Black Widow of all people, who I basically thought was invincible. Then I played MechWarrior 2 Mercenaries, and Deadeye, the tutorial mission instructor, had so much character it just stuck out to me over time. After that, in more recent times, them beating the tar out of the Torians is a monumental moment in the fiction as far as mercenaries are concerned, and I think it's been extremely well done. I'm not as big on their Dark Age components, which is one reason why I didn't go too deep into that here. But yeah, they're my favorite mercenary unit. I'll rep the Rough Riders into the cold, dark future, ready to raise hell right alongside them. While mercenaries aren't going to make it into any of my top 5 lists for any factions I have for Battletech, the Rough Riders sure as hell tried. So there you have it, my favorite mercenaries. And the one at the top is Hanson's Rough Riders. Look on the bright side, kid. You get to keep all the money. Thank you all for joining me here today. I want to apologize to everyone for being slow on content this month. I do promise it's in service of a massive new video I'm working on that will be over three hours long. It's about the Warhammer 2C and it will cover the mech, its origins, the origins of its creators, Clan Star Adder, its journey into becoming a second line mech, and its road to redemption as well as covering big portions of Clan Seafox's history and delving a bit into Clan Snowraven's latter materials, and how it all ties into the Warhammer 2C, which was right along for the adventure the whole time. The video is also going to have guest voices from multiple other friends of the channel, and I'm going to have three, perhaps even four, custom full-blown art pieces, like the ones you're seeing right now of the Warhammer 2C, representing the various eras in the video. Also, a huge thank you to the great Alan Blackwell for agreeing to work with me to bring these images to life. Before all of that giant video happens though, I will be getting the cougar out for everyone before Christmas. So with that, if you enjoyed my mercenary ranking video, don't forget to like if you had a good time and subscribe if you're new here. I've got plenty more content coming. Also, as per usual, I want to give a huge thank you to all the YouTube channel members. This content is really only made possible because of viewers like you. And I also want to give another shout out to the new Captain General tier members who have made the art we're getting done for the long format videos possible. There's going to be a lot of crazy things coming out in the New Year's, you guys. So with all of that, which is your favorite mercenary unit? There are tons of them out there, like literally hundreds. Let me know in the comments section below, and I'll catch you all there.